Okay, today what we uh, want to do is first uh, we want to finish up a little bit of a subject uh, with respect to particle orbits. And that is that you remember that we said we were interested in zero gyro, or small gyro radius. So the first kind of kind of question you might ask is what would the finite uh, gyro radius effects be? Now, phenomenologically, what we expect to happen, let's just think about it, is suppose that I have, let's suppose I have, we're going to be interested in waves in a while. So suppose I have an electric field which E, you know, as a function of X, let's say, looks like this. And if my gyro radius is small, uh, you know, so small as I can barely see it, then, you know, I get the local electric field. On the other hand, what happens if the electric field becomes, I'm sorry, if the gyro radius becomes about that big? Well, the problem is then that I might not get the local electric field, but I might effectively have the electric field averaged over the gyro radius. So the question is, what would happen uh, if that were to be the case? Well, remember that we had that the force we were interested in was the Lorentz force, and if we consider... Uh, perhaps I should say, on E and E cross B uh, drifts. So what I want to do now is just to say we could do it for magnetic fields as well, but electric fields. And you remember that the electric field was then evaluated at the position of the particle, F of X. On the other hand, what we said was really the position of the particle was equal to the guiding center position, the center of the gyro orbit, plus the gyro radius rho, which was a varying quantity. Remember, it, you know, I gyrate around the field line. So we can evaluate this as Q of X guiding center, just do a Taylor series expansion, plus, and we'll just do it sort of formally, rho dot gradient E uh, plus one half, and you'd say rho squared, but in tensorial form, it's rho rho dot del del E plus and so forth. Del del E is a third rank tensor, which would be horrible to calculate, but we won't do anything fancy like that. Now, uh, we know that these gyro frequencies, you know, these are oscillatory things, right? E to the I omega D omega cyclotron T or sine omega cyclotron T or something like that. So if I take the average of this force over a gyro phase, or over a gyro period, so let me do it as over omega ct, then I'm going to get just Q, the electric field at the guiding center, plus, and now this term, this, this will be an oscillatory term, and it's just, you know, the particle going physically back and forth in that electric field away from its guiding center position in an oscillatory way. But that will actually vanish, the, the oscillatory term. And then um, the next, so it just vanished because it's just an oscillatory back and forth in the electric field. The next term uh, will get a half rho squared, but the average of, a, of any term like sine, this will be like sine squared omega ct, and the average of any such term is going to give you a half, and then it turns out it's sort of del perp squared e, plus higher order terms. So this is the average of this term. So the idea then is that the average force on the guiding center averaged over a cyclotron period but evaluated at the guiding center is then equal to the local electric field or at, uh, the electric field at the guiding center even though the particle is oscillating around and then plus one quarter del perp squared times the electric field, again evaluated at the guiding center, plus higher order terms. So all this says is if there's some curvature or second derivative of the electric field at that point, then the average, you know, as I oscillate back and forth, there'll be a little bit of curvature and I'll, and I'll pick up that second order term. So the electric fields Actually, del squared is usually negative, it turns out. So the electric field is then not as large as the local value, but it's averaged over this gyro period, 
and so or gyro uh, radius, and so it becomes a little bit smaller than the electric field there, than the local electric field right at the guiding center. Now, this has an effect. Um, if you remember, we finally had that the electric field, the e, I'm sorry, the E cross B drift was basically equal to the force due to the electric field, which is what we have up here, cross B, all divided by Q B squared. And so if I just stick in this averaged electric field seen at the guiding center of the particle as it gyrates around, uh, the Q cancels out, and we'll get, um, I want to do this a little differently. Uh, It'll be e, basically it'll be E cross B over B squared, but the problem is it'll be not the local E, but it'll be one plus a quarter del perf squared. Uh, I'm sorry, ha ha. I need a, a rho squared there for amplitude, right? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get a, a rho squared. I just forgot to bring my rho squared down. So I need a, a rho squared in there. So it says, you know, it's just a second order derivative and modulated by that. And of course there would be higher order terms. How about del cubed or third derivative? Won't be any because that will oscillate average to zero. But del to the fourth there would be del to the sixth, eighth, tenth. Uh, but we'll assume we have small armor radius because otherwise we'd have to get into that. And then this operates on the electric field evaluated at the guiding center cross B divided by B squared. So if we, did, if we were back in the small gyro radius limit, then we'd be perfectly happy to take away this term and say we, you know, rho is small compared to the scale length there. And, uh, and we just have the local E cross B drift. On the other hand, suppose, as we will end up being interested in in waves, that E goes like E to the I k dot x, you know, minus I omega t or something like that then that del squared, which is del dot del, it turns out, we'll, and we'll come back to this, we'll go, we'll go, would go to ik dot ik, and that's equal to uh, minus k squared. That being the case, then our um, E cross B drift will become approximately 1 minus one quarter k squared rho squared plus the higher order terms times the E cross B velocity. So what this says, again, is that the finite Larmor radius effects, if k perp, this should be a k perp, actually, because it's uh, really del perp, so it would be del perp dot del terp, k perps, perpendicular magnetic field. This says that uh, if we have finite gyro radius, finite k per rho, uh, then we'll get a, a non-zero, that is. We'll get a slight correction to the local E cross B drift, and it'll be a little bit smaller, since this is a positive definite term, a little bit smaller than the local value by k rho squared. <laughs> so this is a kind of uh, thing we have to keep in mind, and uh, when we come back, when we later treat uh, various types of instabilities uh, whereby we consider uh, finite Larmor radius effects, again, compared to uh, the electric field, we'll have to take this into account. Now, by the way, would I worry about finite Larmor radius effects on ions or electrons? Well, ions have got the big gyro radii for the same temperature, so I'd be most concerned about ion finite Larmor radius effects. Uh, but sometimes we're even concerned about electrons. Okay, um, next subject we want to go into then is we'll start into Chen's chapter 3 and or Bittencourt's chapter 6 through 9. Uh, just Bittencourt's uh, is for general uh, background. And what we're going to do now then is try to discuss what I'll call an introduction because we're not going to derive too much. So introduction to plasmas as fluids. And this is Chen, chapter 2, or sorry, 3, 
and Bittencourt, chapters uh, 6-9, and you'll notice we've skipped over 5, and that's because that's kinetic theory, and we're going to come back to kinetic theory later. Okay, now, first, um, let's go after just the basic thing I want to talk about first here is kind of how should we look upon a plasma? Um, you know, what, it's made up of a whole bunch of particles. What kind of a description, a particle description, a fluid description, or something? And so first, let's just consider a microscopic view. By microscopic, what I really mean is, okay, it's made up of a whole bunch of individual free charged particles. <coughs> what happens for those charged particles? Where do they go? I mean, I'm trying to get a description of the thing here. Well, for all free particles, you know, uh, not bound in some medium, and certainly our charged particles in the plasma are not bound, they're just flipping around and so forth. Um, what we have is that we should solve F equals MA, okay, force equals mass times acceleration, or of course the way we write it is M dV dt, M times acceleration is the Lorentz force, Q, E plus V cross B. Okay, so for every particle, I go in and I say he's located here, and here's the electric field, here's the magnetic field, and I get the particle trajectory, you know, moving along. Uh, where do I really get the electric and magnetic fields? I better use Maxwell's equations, right? Or uh, they may have some externally imposed electric field and magnetic field, but generally speaking, I have to get the electric and magnetic field uh, fields from Maxwell's equations. Now, um, then the first form, I'm going to write them, are in their vacuum form, where what I have in mind is that the plasma is composed of a whole bunch of free charges, not a dielectric medium, just a bunch of free uh, plus and minus charges. And so if I could then calculate, here's, uh, let's label them from once. Uh, first, we'll have uh, Gauss's law. And then we'll have um, Faraday's induction law. Curl E is equal to minus. We're not going to solve all these, of course, most of the time, but at least we've got to write them down once. Uh, Faraday induction law. And then there's the fact that we don't have any monopoles. No magnetic monopoles, sorry. There are, of course, electrostatic monopoles, which are the charges. No magnetic monopoles. And then finally, our last Faraday, or, or uh, Maxwell's equation, is curl B is equal to mu naught J plus um, D, I'm sorry, need an epsilon naught in there, D electric field by DT. And this is a so called Ampere's law. So if we want to calculate for each particle where it goes, remember the last, last subject we've been dealing with here is tell me what the electric and magnetic fields are, and I'll tell you where the particle goes. And that's what we calculated. So now I'm saying, OK, now where are we going to get the electric and magnetic fields in the plasma? Well, we're going to get them from Maxwell's equations. But Maxwell's equations need to, us to tell them what the charge density is and what the current density is. And where are we going to get that? Well, you know, we got all these particles moving around and they create, each one of them creates a part of the charge density, right? And each one of them as they move creates a current density. <coughs> so we can write that out. Um, namely, uh, so then, let's call this obtain rho comma j from summing over particles. 
So in particular, we'll say that the charge density at any position, spatial position in particular time, is going to be the sum over all particles, which I'll make I equals 1 to capital N, of the charge on that particle, Q sub I. And you remember we're purely classical here, so there's no quantum mechanical effects. So all particles are delta functions. Okay? So we'll just make him use a delta function X. And where's he really located? <coughs> well, I don't know exactly, but there's sort of this Xi of T, which is you know, where he goes in space and time, okay? So this is the particle trajectory, which I presumably calculate from F equals MA. Okay? And my current density, likewise, J of X and T, is similar to the sum over all species of the charge on the species, the velocity of that particular species, you know, at that space and time position, and then we also have for it delta is x minus uh, xi of t, wherever it moves around to. So in principle, I have now a closed system of equations. Okay? I go along here and I say, well, here's f equals ma, and uh, I can calculate where the particles move, just like we did last chapter of Chen here, for given electric and magnetic fields. And then I go to Maxwell's equations and I compute the electric and magnetic fields from Maxwell's equations given the charge density and the current density. And then I, where do I get the current charge density and current density? Well, I get it from where all the particles are. So this is obviously first a self-consistent process. But this is the most general. This is actually the way you do it in kinetic theory. But anyway, this is the most general way you proceed. What's the problem with this? Well, consider... How, how big is N? You know, I, I just said I was going to um, sum over all the particles in the plasma. How big is N? Well, consider a, a plasma. This uh, example will be the Phaedrus T or a typical tokamak plasma. Uh, we'd have a density of, let's say, 10 to the 19th per cubic, per cubic meter. And how big is the plasma in volume? Well, it turns out it's on the order of a meter cubed, plus or minus a factor of two or so. So this will give me a total number of particles of number density times volume of, you know, just multiply them out here, about 10 to the 19th particles. So in other words, this little schema that I just told you about says we have to follow 10 to the 19th particles around, you know, to collect the charge densities to put into Maxwell's equation, charge and current densities, to put into Maxwell's equations, to put into uh, F equals MA to figure out where the particles go, and we have to do that all self-consistently. Now, you might, that, that's sort of an ambitious undertaking, uh, namely impossible. Uh, I mean, 10 to the 19th particles is, uh, you know, a number, 10 to the 19th is even larger than the uh, U.S. Uh, debt in uh, dollars, you know. I mean, it's a really big number. And uh, you, could imagine, you could say, well, I've got a big computer, okay? And I can follow a lot of particles around. But, um, you know, at this moment, about the most number of particles that people follow around, and people actually execute this scheme. It's called particle pushing type of computer simulation. Um, about the most they can follow is on the order of 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th particles, okay? So let's just say most computers that's actually Cray computers, uh, can follow only of order 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th particles. So the little schema that I just outlined simply won't work. Or let me put it this way. We don't have the, the computational or personal uh, uh, tools to be able to execute that procedure. So what this tells us is that somehow or other we're going to have to um, not view the plasma as a bunch of individual particles and add them up. And because of that, okay, so, um, so cannot um, do microscopic approach and rather 
what we're driven to and, you know, would generally like uh, is we'll go to some fluid or macroscopic approach. So the idea is, um, again, just that microscopically uh, we uh, would say, well, you know, we'll just add all these particles up, but pragmatically it's just uh, it's too forbidding a task. And when you go into so-called kinetic theory, as we'll do in part later or in particular in the course 725, you actually start with this prescription and then you try to take certain averages of it to get average over all the particles or things like that to obtain a fluid-like description. But we won't kind of go into the details of that uh, in this course. We'll just talk about some of these things. But I thought you ought to realize first why we don't do it that way. It's just too, too complicated a task. I should say there are some plasmas which only have, you know, 10 to the 6 particles or so for which you could do this. And people do uh, carry out this procedure in some cases. But it, it is a pretty complicated sort of thing. So that's the microscopic view. Let's now consider the a macroscopic view. Now, here, you remember, I just, when I put down Maxwell's equations, I had in mind that what I was doing was I was considering all the particles in the plasma were free charged particles moving around that would contribute to the dielectric constant, or I'm sorry, to the, to the uh, charge density and the current in the plasma. But the sort of opposite view, which you often take in various areas of electro, electricity and magnetism, is you say, well, I don't want to worry about all the details of, the, uh, uh, of where all the charged particles or charge carriers can move. Rather, I want to consider that this is just a dielectric medium. And so the idea in macroscopics is you like to ask, can I consider the plasma, in this case, as a dielectric medium? And for that, uh, Maxwell's equations then have a slightly different form. Namely, they become the divergence of the displacement vector is equal to whatever extra free charges we have uh, left. Um, the Faraday induction law, it turns out, is unchanged. Curl B is equal to minus dB dt. Um, curl of B uh, is equal to zero. Again, no magnetic monopoles. And then my Faraday, and, I'm sorry, my Ampere's law becomes curl of H is equal to J free, the free current, free charge, uh, free char the current caused by the free charge motions, plus D displacement vector by dt. But now, of course, this is not a closed set by itself. Uh, in particular, I have to add to this that, say, the displacement vector d is some dielectric constant epsilon times e, and also that the magnetic induction b is equal to mu h. And so the question becomes, for a plasma then, is what uh, do we use for a plasma for uh, the dielectric constant epsilon and the magnetic susceptibility mu, magnetic permeability mu. Um, so that's what we need to next address. What, what, what would we use for those? Well, um, let me make some observations, let's put it that way. So. The first observation is that uh, we spend a little time talking about particle orbits, and uh, in a magnetized plasma, things are different along fields and perpendicular to fields. Um, so parallel to B and perpendicular to B, motions are different. What kind of an effect would that have on the dielectric constant and magnetic permeability 
that we would be getting. Well, it turns out that then you can imagine that this dielectric constant becomes not a dielectric constant, but a dielectric tensor. And then we have that the displacement vector is the dielectric tensor dotted into the electric field. And similarly for B. So, namely, uh, likewise, B is, turns out is equal to uh, mu dot H. So that's a little, let's just say, awkward, awkward uh, but we're going to end up doing that. Uh, and in truth, uh, that's uh, kind of what happens. Um, now, so, so the first observation is that we won't be able, except in certain specialized circumstances, uh, where we get rid of the mag magnetic field, for instance, or where we consider certain particular types of oscillations, we generally will have to deal with a full dielectric tensor or dielectric uh, tensor uh, I call it, electric susceptibility. Um, now, the other problem is that um, in plasmas, the dielectric um, constant is usually non-local. Um, And I'll try to explain what I mean by that. Uh, usually non-local, not localized in space and time. And it's non-linear. Um, so uh, let me illustrate that first, do the, the non-local. And we'll kind of come back to this uh, later, so I'll just, just mention it. But what happens is that in truth, this displacement is equal to dielectric tensor dotted into E. That would imply, you know, I didn't write it down here, that that would imply that that is at a given space and time position. But it turns out a plasma medium is, is going to be set, well, let's just remember we had these particle orbits that move tremendous distances along field lines, magnetic field lines in reasonable times. And perpendicular to field lines, they have this gyro motion. So that's a complication, let's just say. And on the other hand, we're going to find that plasmas have admit waves, waves like uh, sound waves in this room, uh, quite readily. So what it's going to turn out is that a proper description of the, dial of the displacement vector D, uh, related electric field, will be the Fourier-Laplace inverse transform of, and, and I'll have to write it out here so I can describe it, e to the i k dot x minus i omega t, and then the dielectric tensor, which I will put a little hat on, uh, k and omega dot electric field of k and omega. And what I'm sort of trying to say um, is it's non-local in x and t, but it's, but the dielectric tensor is local often in its Fourier-Laplace transform in its transform space k and omega. So again, what this means is you cannot take this form here and put it into this form here unless, frankly, the electric field has some very particular uh, characteristics. So the general observation is that is that this sort of description is just not applicable for a plasma. Now, slightly, again, going a little further along this line, um, the question about uh, the magnetic susceptibility. So that my next uh, subject here is the, is the nonlinear part. And there, what we need to do is to um, reflect upon, is perhaps the best word here, um, how we um, deal with the fact that there, remember we, when we have a magnetic field, we have these particles um, gyrating around a magnetic field. So we have particles gyrating around a magnetic field. 
and they have a magnetic moment, which in this case is down, let's say. Make that a little darker. And it turns out that that will give us a current, which is the curl of the magnetization, and the magnetization is going to be the sum over, again, all these particles, uh, with each of them having a magnetic moment. So, uh, to sort of cryptic or lowest order, a plasma is going to act like a magnetized medium because I got all these particles around field lines, diamagnetic, it turns out. Remember, it tries to cancel it. So, if that's the case, well, we can go back um, and imagine, let's just say, that we had curl B is equal to mu naught J plus epsilon naught dE dt. And now what I would uh, like to do is uh, I would like to try to convert this. Well, I, I need to say then that J is then going to be the number of free charge or the current due to the free charges. And maybe I should have made that J sub M the magnetization current plus the magnetization current. And what I want to do is this is the, uh, this is the vacuum form of Ampere's law, and I'd like to convert that to the um, dielectric medium form, which is given by curl of H is equal to uh, J free plus uh, epsilon naught dE dt, or, well, I won't worry about that part. It really should be dd, dt, and so forth, but anyway. Now, so when I stick this j into here, um, I get two components of it, and if I then um, put all that together, uh, this equation becomes the curl of b over mu naught, so I took the mu naught underneath. Mu naught's a constant, commutes with the del, no problems. And then uh, for the J magnetization, that's the curl of an M. So I actually get, uh, oops, sorry, minus sign, minus this magnetization due to the fact that the plasma is made up with char a lot of charged particles, each with magnetic dipoles, uh, magnetic dipoles. Um, and this will then be equal to uh, no mu naught, just took care of it, uh, J free uh, plus epsilon naught dE dt. So now comparing this, oh, and I should have said this was the dielectric form. Uh, form. Comparing this, what we see is that we should associate that the H is that, Free charge is indeed the free, or free current is the free current due to freely moving charges, and that's that. So what we find is that we should uh, say that H is equal to B over mu naught minus M, or alternatively, that B is equal to mu naught H uh, plus the magnetization. Oh, sorry, yeah, I'm going off the bottom here. So now, uh, what do we want to do about that? Well, I can see we forgot to remember up here, what is the magnitude of this magnetic moment of a particle? Uh, it was mv perp squared over 2, uh, plus a few constants like 2 pi and q and a few things like that, but didn't have any extra b's in it. And so this is mv perp squared all over 2b. So if I were to write this B as I would like to, which is some mu scalar times H, although we really found that it was probably a tensor, what we would find is then mu is equal to mu naught. That's that part right there. And then the other term, the magnetization, would then be, you know, a sum over all these magnetic moments. And the problem is 
this goes proportional to 1 over b. So the problem then is that my relationship is nonlinear, namely b equals mu h is b equals 1 plus some constant over b times h. So, you know, I got a b on both sides and I don't have any easy way of solving it. And in particular, if I multiplied it out, I'd get a b squared term, hence the nonlinearity. So this is the, the problem with the nonlinearity. Let me uh, go back to the preceding slide then. It's that b is equal to mu h uh, re require or uh, has or would have, let's say, uh, mu is equal to mu naught times 1 plus uh, some constant divided by b. And the fact that uh, this b is there and that one is there, namely our coefficient, which was supposed to be more or less of a constant, um, turns out to be uh, not the best assumption in the world. Uh, so this is the, the nonlinearity. If I multiply all that out, I'll get a b squared. So the idea then is that the purely macroscopic uh, approach of saying a plasma is a dielectric constant, and here's the dielectric constant and the magnetic susceptibility, um, is really not a very good approach either. Okay? So what do we do? Well, we kind of go halfway in between. Okay? So uh, let's say plasma approach. I don't know what else to call it. So the basic idea is don't assume or, or don't uh, use a, I guess I'll call it universal for a moment, mu, but instead we calculate uh, epsilon and mu. Um, and uh, by assuming uh, basically the uh, vacuum form of uh, Maxwell's equations, that we have free um, charges and uh, currents, or well, free charged, let's see, particles creating um, charge density and current density. Now, uh, and then we uh, use uh, these in Maxwell's equations. Now, we're then going to be left with, uh, well, even if we do this, um, we then need to ask, well, how are we actually going to calculate? Uh, so, so we still have our Maxwell's equations, but how are we actually going to calculate rho and j is really what it comes down to. Rho and j in a plasma. Uh, I should say use Maxwell's equations in the vacuum form. So we're going to use Maxwell's equations to help us count uh, with free charges to help us calculate and figure out what the effective or appropriate dielectric constant is. And what we're going to find is that we're going to have a wide variety of dielectric constants for low frequency, high frequency, medium frequency, parallel to a magnetic field, perpendicular to a magnetic field, uh, all kinds of speciality cases, let's put it that way. And so a large part of what goes on in plasma physics is trying to calculate all of the responses, all of the different types of dielectric constant responses you can get. Okay, let's briefly, though, mention how are we going to get this, um, how are we going to calculate rho and j in the plasma? 
Now, uh, what possibilities are there? Well, um, so maybe I'll just say, how could we? Um, the first one is, is the way that we said, is uh, sum up responses over all n integral d cubed x, n uh, particles in the plasma. And we'll just say that's uh, impossible. What would be the other uh, types or approaches that we could use? Well, uh, the, uh, the other types, let me go next to kinetic theory. Um, and I won't, we, we'll come back to this later, um, later in the course. But the basic idea is uh, this averages over all uh, particles in a plasma. And what, you, what it leads to is a distribution function of the particles, and they're distributed in real space, in velocity space, and in time. And uh, this is, in some sense, the more rigorous way of proceeding, um, but unfortunately, it's rather complicated. Um, so we'll leave it to later, and we'll try to approach things uh, more simply than this. In a, uh, so let's say, complicated, but maybe I should say semi-rigorous. We'll talk about some problems of it later, or in 725, people talk about it. Uh, but it's about as rigorous a description as people usually provide uh, for plasmas, in fact. So what's the, what's, what, what are we really going to do? Well, you always keep reducing these things. You average over things. And if I had, first I had a distribution function of where all the particles precisely were. In kinetic theory, you average them over little boxes, and you get their average distribution in real space, velocity space, and time. But the last way, and what we'll end up doing, is a fluid theory. And there, what you do is you take this distribution function or, and, and equations for it, and you average that, uh, average f, over um, velocity space. So you say, I really don't care about all the details of exactly what velocity each particle has. All I care about is, say, an, an equation for the time evolution of the density, dn dt, uh, for the um, flow velocity, say, of the plasma, dv dt, and so forth. Okay. So the idea is that what we will want to do in a little bit here is we'll want to give ourselves some fluid equations density conservation equation, momentum conservation equation, or density evolution equation, flow, fluid flow evolution equation. But now, a plasma is a little more complicated than most media because it turns out there's no good reason why a plasma has to have, for instance, equal electron and ion temperatures. It turns out collisions are pretty weak in a plasma. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to mention, is this fluid theory exact? Well, Bittencourt talks about this some, but I think most of you have had some form of kinetic theory, fluid mechanics comments. And the basic comment is I can get a density conservation equation, and that's dn dt, let me just write it down, dn dt uh, plus del dot nv is equal to zero. So you look at that and you say, well, okay, what's the velocity v? And then you go into the, the fluid moment equation for V, and you get dV dt is equal to a bunch of things. And uh, there's, it turns out, something called a stress tensor pi in there, or a pressure P. And you say, what are those? And you have to go to other equations. And the problem with any fluid theory is any one equation is not closed, and you have to have a kinetic theory to close the equations. So 
a fluid theory is always an approximation um, that, that lacks some of the details, um, uh, lacking uh, details and requiring or requires uh, what's called a closure. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Closure relationships, they're called. So, what else about a plasma in our description? How could we calculate? Well, uh, this is more in the realm of uh, complications. Um, so, let's say four plasma complications. Well, the first is that uh, because it's a relatively collisionless plasma, it's not at all clear that the electron temperature is going to be equal to the ion temperature. Is electron density going to be equal to the electron ion density, by the way? How about more or less for quasi-neutrality, right? Um, how about in the magnetic field, to put in a magnetic field? Suppose there are no significant amount of collisions. Well, it turns out then the pressure perpendicular may not be equal to the pressure parallel. Okay, or alternatively, the temperature T perp does not equal T parallel. 